Welcome to today's ACM uh, learning webinar, What Time Is It? A Guide to Time for Software Developers by George Neville Neal. The presentation starts at the top of the hour and lasts 60 minutes. Slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You can resize the slide area as well as other windows by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide window. Well, we'd like to give you some highlights before uh, we head into the webinar uh, itself of all of the uh, various tools and services that the ACM offers for software developers. Uh, so we wanted to mention um, our learning center, which is at httplearning.acm.org. Um, there you will find uh, over 1,400 trusted technical books that are available to ACM members. Um, there's also online training by top vendors um, with some certification capabilities. We have the learning webinars that you are participating uh, in right at this moment, and those are also archived, so you can look at ones that have been done in the past. We have ACM tech packs, which are annotated bibliographies, which are compiled by subject experts. And we also have podcast interviews with innovators and award winners. ACM also has two popular flagship publications. One of them is the communication of the ACM, uh, which you can see online at httpcacm.acm.org. And the other is ACM Q Magazine, which is specifically for software developer practitioners, which is available at httpq.acm.org. Uh, the ACM is also very well known for its digital library, which is the most comprehensive database of computing literature, available at httpdl.acm.org. ACM is also extremely well known for its computer conferences. We have them all throughout the world, uh, and they cover a wide variety of uh, subject areas within computer science. Uh, finally, the ACM is well known for a number of awards that it gives out, including the ACM AM Turing Award, which is effectively the Nobel Prize for computer science. As I mentioned before, uh, if you have any issues with the slide size, you can resize the slides area by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide window, as well as moving the slide area around on the screen. On the bottom panel, you'll find a number of widgets, including Twitter, sharing, and Wikipedia apps. If you are experiencing any problems or issues, you can try to correct these by refreshing the presentation uh, via the F5 key if you're on Windows, or Command-R if you're on a Mac. Uh, if you're on any other sort of browser, generally speaking, browser refresh will probably get things re-going. Um, if you continue to have issues, you could try to close and relaunch the presentation. There's also a help guide available for the webcast, which is down as the help widget in the bottom dock. Uh, to control the volume of the presentation, please adjust the master volume on your computer. If the volume is still too low, you could try to use headphones. If you think of a question during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box and click on the Submit button. You do not need to wait until the end of the presentation to begin submitting questions. That is, you can do it at any time during the presentation at all. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll be pushing out a survey to you in your browser. Please take a minute to fill it out as it will help us improve uh, the topics and the nature of the uh, webinars that we do for you in the future. Uh, you can download a copy of the slides by clicking on the resources widget in the bottom dock. Finally, this session is being recorded and it will be archived for on-demand viewing over the next one to two days. Uh, if you have subscribed to or uh, registered for the webinar, you should be receiving an automatic email notification when it's available. You can also check uh, the learning site, httplearning.acm.org slash webinar uh, for all of the past archived webinars. Talk back. Uh, we are also following some social media channels as part of the webinar today, so uh, you can use Twitter to uh, tweet favorite quotes or even questions uh, using the hashtag hash ACM webinar time. Uh, you can also submit questions via Twitter to the at ACM education uh, account. And finally, we do have the sharing widgets in the bottom panel to allow you to share this presentation with friends and colleagues. 
So now we'll move on to George in the presentation. Just one more word uh, that uh, some of you, of course, may know George uh, better as regular ACMQ columnist, uh, Code Vicious. So on to you, George. Thank you, Terry. Uh, as uh, Terry points out, yes, I, I write for ACMQ as Code Vicious, although I will not be giving the talk as Code Vicious, code vicious uh, for which you should all be thankful. Uh, so let's talk a bit about time. Uh, let's talk about what time it is and what time is it uh, a guide to time for software developers. Time is an illusion. Uh, there's a famous quote from uh, Douglas Adams, time is an illusion, lunchtime doubly so, in uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which I've always really liked. Uh, so time was created by people, for people. It provides ordering to the day. Uh, it's really necessary for basic human communication. It would be a, a, quite a challenge in any language to spend an entire day and not refer to time. A time is really intrinsic to what it means to be uh, people and to how we work with each other, and it's really something that we all have to deal with all the time, certainly in the modern world. Um, time, the history of time, and not a brief history of time, but the history of time uh, shows a finer and finer grain of time that we care about. You know, at one point, all we cared about was the seasons because we didn't all want to starve. Uh, eventually, we came up with months, and then we jiggled them around for various Roman emperors. Days, hours, minutes, seconds, time zones, which is not on this list, uh, which show up in the 19th century when we can finally travel fast enough that it actually matters, uh, you know, what time it is in London or Paris or New York or Los Angeles. Uh, so, you know, over time, we have actually gotten to finer and finer grains of time. And as computer scientists and software engineers and programmers, we start to care about uh, time generally when we talk about seconds, milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds. Um, physicists care about even finer grains, but we're not going to talk about any of those today. Uh, what I do want to talk about today is how we do timekeeping in these finer areas and how people can deal with time in their programs and how they can uh, make sure that data centers full of machines are relatively well synchronized because that becomes incredibly important now that almost any uh, significant application that runs on the internet or runs for anyone doesn't run on a single machine anymore. Uh, when an application ran on a mainframe, uh, which is before I was born, but when it was a single computer, the time uh, was important in terms of how long something took, but in terms of synchronization with another outside source, generally was not very important. It might have been important in certain applications, but you know what time it was was not as important to your you know payroll batch job uh, as it was to say you know flying an airplane or uh, flying a spacecraft. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, timekeeping at the at the finer levels. And we'll talk about both how programs interact with the computer to get time, because it turns out that's non-trivial, uh, as well as what happens when we start doing distributed time, which is pretty much something everyone now has to worry about in building their systems. So I want to talk about how you use time in your programs, uh, how it's deployed. But one of the things to realize is that in uh, software today, in any data center, uh, time is a pervasive issue. So if you think about um, applications like financial applications, uh, financial applications that interact with markets uh, in terms of stock markets or uh, currency markets, these need to be well synchronized because uh, the time is actually how you make a decision on who uh, got something done at, the, at a particular moment. So one of the ways I like to think about time when talking about looking at distributed systems is we're trying to answer the question, who did what to whom and when? And so if you think of a financial application, uh, people trading on markets, it really matters if uh, you know, the application A traded something before application B, because that actually has a real financial uh, consequence. Right? And so that's something that's really important. And at this point, everyone needs to worry about this. The software developers need to worry about this because every system pretty much is a distributed system. There are a small number of systems that really only ever talk to themselves and don't interact over the internet. But most applications that most software developers are looking at today are distributed systems. They're distributed in terms of uh, 
uh, you know, sharding data across multiple systems to do database operations in a data center. And they're also distributed systems because you've got multiple data centers or you're communicating across the internet to actually get something done. And so all of this uh, feeds into why, why would you care about time? Why do you care about time in your programs? And how are you going to use it? So there's uh, two sets of APIs uh, that you get on most systems. Uh, much of what I'll talk about today, you'll see on Unix-like systems, Linux, the BSDs, uh, the systems that run in data centers. Obviously, uh, Windows has its own way of getting the, the time, so desktop systems also do that. Uh, in terms of desktop systems like a Mac, uh, that's a Unix-based system, so a good time of day is pretty common there. And for a very long time, the main way in which programmers interacted with the clock on their system was to use get time of day. And get time of day is a system call that calls into the operating system and says, you know, tell me what time it is. And that's uh, sort of the standard that everyone has used for a long time. There are quite a number of problems with that standard. One is that it's a fairly expensive operation. And we'll talk about why, that, why that's expensive a little later on, but let's just accept for the moment that that's, you know, a non-trivial amount of time. Uh, in terms of CPU time to get the time. time um, so if you're looking at an application, for instance, uh, that's logging a lot of data and, you know, you need to update your log files, you want to have a reasonable set of timestamps, uh, using get time of day a lot is going to actually incur a significant, you know, a non-trivial amount of overhead on the application. And so it's one of the things that people don't think about when they start thinking about programming with time. They just throw these calls all over their code, and they decide, well, you know, we're just going to print out the time that way. Uh, later on, there's a, a set of routines you can find called clock get time. Uh, this gives you finer grain control. And one of, the, one of the controls it gives is the ability to say, I care more about the cost of this call than about the accuracy. So one of the constant tensions in dealing with time in computer systems is the cost of the accuracy. And this you know, it's something that you come across every time you're dealing with time. When I first started looking at distributed time systems about seven or eight years ago, uh, the people I was working for had been using what everybody uses pretty much. Uh, if they're not doing a specialized application, they were using NTP, uh, the NTP daemon. This is not giving them, uh, you know, a high enough quality of time. And they said, well, we need to have better time. And I said, uh, you know, how good does it have to be? And they said, well, it should be perfect. Um, this is kind of a problem in the computer industry because computer scientists and software engineers are pretty much used to the idea that when you use a computer, if you uh, put in a calculation, if there are no bugs, they're usually bugs, but if there are no bugs, you will always get the same accuracy out. You know, if you, in particular, if you're doing integer arithmetic, the integer arithmetic is never going to come back uh, the same. So, uh, with time, that's not the case, right? The higher the accuracy you want, if you start caring about things like, if you go from seconds to milliseconds, milliseconds to microseconds, microseconds to nanoseconds, uh, those jumps are going to cost you an order of magnitude in money and time and effort to get them right. And this has been true in every system that I've looked at. So um, this tension between accuracy and quality and you know how much time or how much energy you have to put into getting out the right answer is something that will come up throughout the presentation. And as you uh, look at time in both you know data center and internet scale, you'll find this again and again that the the most important question is how accurate do you need it? Right? And there are different levels of accuracy and, and different costs associated with them. So coming back to these APIs, a get time of day has one level of accuracy, and it's based on you know the quality of your operating system, its software, uh, and the underlying hardware. And it's, you know, good enough for seconds. It's usually good enough for milliseconds. But once you get down to mics and nanos, uh, it usually isn't the best way to go. And you're not going to get anything uh, really good out of that. Clock get time gives you this ability to choose uh, fast time. You know, I would like the time quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of CPU on that, which means don't go do any adjustments. Uh, don't spend a lot of time in the, in the operating system's kernel getting me a more accurate time. Or you can say, no, I, I want the most accurate time you can possibly get me, and I'm willing to uh, expend some CPU time, some CPU resources to get that. And that was put in because get time of day was just, you know, one way of doing it, and it wasn't uh, giving the programmer enough control. 
So why is this hard and why do we have this tension? Um, you know, if you buy, uh, if your, your company's buying, you know, whatever computer you're buying, uh, when you servers, massive computers, one of the cheapest parts in that is a 10 cent crystal. And, uh, you know, 10 cent crystal is not an expensive component. And that's how the motherboard makers like it. And everyone uses the same crystals and they generally have, uh, a pretty, uh, consistently poor ability to uh, track time. And we'll talk about that in a moment, what that actually means. Um, but there's a whole bunch of things that can affect the way time runs in the computer and, and the way that the crystal influences the clock is, you know, the, the crystal is vibrating at a particular frequency, but that frequency is not constant. Uh, various things can affect the frequency that the crystal oscillates at. A classic one is hot and cold. If you look at the frequency of a crystal sitting in a data center when all the machines are running and they're all running hot versus when they're all not running and they're, you know, and they're colder, you'll see that the frequency changes uh, quite dramatically. And that frequency affects time throughout the entire system. Um, crystals age. So, you know, over the four years of a typical server's lifetime, the frequency of that crystal will change just because of the crystal itself uh, aging. Workload effect, as you load up a system and its CPU and all of its other attendant uh, hardware with actual work, uh, that will also change the quality of the time in the system. And getting this right is harder than you, and I always put, it to, put this in, or your management might think. I mean, people who don't spend a lot of time looking at clocks and looking at how computer-based time works you know, they sort of have this view of the computer as a, a near perfect machine. Right? You know, you just turn the crank and, and things come out. Uh, and time is a physical system. It's, you know, you're dealing with analog components. You're not dealing with digital inputs all of the time. And you're dealing with environmental effects. And so controlling for all of those is much harder than you think. So here's a couple of pictures. On the left-hand side is a picture off the internet of a typical cell phone, uh, iPhone. And on the right is a mechanical watch. And this happens to be my mechanical watch. That is a uh, mechanical watch used uh, by a locomotive engineer from Japan Rail in the 1960s when they still used mechanical watches and every single engineer carried one. Uh, the interesting thing about this photo is that if I were to turn off the network connection on the cell phone on the left, it would be no more accurate and possibly less accurate than the mechanical clock on the right. Uh, the history of timekeeping is a history of making, for a long time, mechanical clocks more accurate. And certainly a mid 20th century mechanical clock is actually more accurate or as accurate as a cheap 10 cent crystal that's sitting in your cell phone or in your server. Uh, a lot of people are really surprised to, to hear that. Uh, but you can, you can go look this kind of stuff up and, and see how poorly uh, computer-based systems track time. That's the reason for that slide. Uh, no, no presentation is uh, uh, <clears throat> no presentation is complete without a, a comic from XKCD. Uh, we know that technology always makes things better, so clearly, you know, adding digital timekeeping to systems was a great way to improve our lives. Uh, this is XKCD's comment on the, the upcoming smartwatches that people are all going to be wearing. But uh, move off that. So, I mean, how bad is it? So this graph, uh, which you see here, it looks pretty clear, um, is showing what happens if you have a computer-based system listening to time but not regulating its internal clock. And you can see that this is wandering uh, by you know several microseconds, and that that graph. Uh, will continue to wander away from, you know, good zero time for as long as you let it. This is a 20, let's see, this is a two hour uh, look at, you know, a single server that's listening to time but not adjusting its clock internally. Uh, and, you know, in the absence of any correction, the system is not going to come back towards zero. It's going to go off by seconds, then minutes, then however long it's going to go off. Uh, depending on the crystal and the heat in the room and the server load and all the environmental uh, things we discussed earlier. 
So the offset actually starts off at zero zero. That's in the upper left hand corner. Uh, we we do this for two hours. By the end of the two hours, we're 15 milliseconds slow. Uh, and this is very typical behavior. If you were to look at uh, any uh, commodity server or commodity desktop or commodity laptop, they would all show some form of this graph. Now, some of them might run faster. Some of them might run slower. Some of them might eventually oscillate. This system was not oscillating yet. It was oscillating in how bad it was getting. But it's you see that there's no correction. It's not coming back towards the zero point at all in this graph. So why does this matter? Well, there's a whole bunch of places where this really does matter. Um, the one that I think is most commonly understood now is debugging distributed systems. I said earlier, there's this question that we always want to try and answer, which is who did what to whom and when? And in distributed systems, this is an incredibly important question, in particular if you're debugging a, a distributed system. So when you think about, say, uh, you know, a web ordering platform, someone places an order, you know, a message reaches a front end server, the front end server, you know, may send messages to several other servers to ask them to complete the order. Uh, if the order fails, one of the things you're going to have to look at or the, the developer or the SRE or whoever is going to have to look at is, you know, what are the events that happened on the various systems that were supposed to finish uh, executing that order? And if you don't have well-regulated time, then you don't know whether or not the database server saw the message before or after the server that happens to process the credit card. Uh, these kinds of uh, debugging situations occur all the time, and this is time within a single data center. But being able to get that kind of time across a set of servers and a set of services to the point where you can actually say who did what to whom is incredibly important. Um, you know, and if it's hard to do it in a data center, it's even harder to do it on the harder to do it on the internet. So distrib uh, dis debugging distributed systems is now sort of the most common case that I think most people come up come across uh, that's reconciling online transactions. But then we get to other uh, interesting applications, robots and automation. Uh, if you've got a series of machines that are moving in physical space to achieve a job and they don't agree on what time it is and their you know, a mechanical arm is moving at 40 miles an hour, uh, that's going to cause serious damage if it's out of sync, right? And it's going to possibly cause damage to a person or to the equipment. And so factory floor automation is a very common uh, application of high quality time. Power grids, uh, you know, all power grids are interconnected on some level, uh, and the, you know, they're getting larger all the time. Uh, to have power actually supplied, you have to synchronize uh, 60 hertz in the US, 50 hertz in Europe um, systems, you know, to a, a fairly fine granularity, so that when you bring another power station online, you don't have a catastrophic, catastrophic failure. And a power grid catastrophic failure is uh, quite impressive. You should look at some uh, videos of that. It's, it's not a simple case of, oops, there's a bug. It's more, oops, we just blew something up or knocked out power to a city. Um, and lastly, cellular networks. Uh, in order to get more and more services on cellular networks, and in particular getting things like video, which is you know, a, a thing that a lot of people want to have on their cell phones, uh, you need to synchronize all the cell towers. You need to synchronize the uh, connection between the phone and the cell tower in order that you can actually uh, provide the services of, say, LTE or uh, the next generation of LTE. So there's a lot of places where we really care about, you know, 15 milliseconds or one millisecond. Uh, So there's a couple of things we need to really understand and define and before we can understand how uh, accurate computer timekeeping can be and how we measure this. Uh, so there are two things, uh, two words that I'm going to define right off. There's synchronization and synchronization. The synchronization is what most people understand if they understand anything about distributed timekeeping. Synchronization is, do I see that it's 1 o'clock when you see that it's 1 o'clock? Do I see that it's lunchtime when you see that it's lunchtime? You know, are our clocks synchronized? Uh, if you've watched enough uh, James Bond films or, you know, films like this, you know, everybody synchronizes their watches before they go to do something. That's synchronization. That's, you know, do we, uh, do end people agree on what time it is? Synchronization is actually the quality of the uh, 
uh, frequency of the clock. So I talked about how crystals change and how the temperature changes the crystal. Synthetization is a measurement of how constant the frequency is. You know, is this vibrating at 60 hertz all the time, or is it 59 and 61 and 60 and 59 and 61 and 60? Uh, the better the synthetization is inside of a crystal or inside of a system, the easier all of the rest of the timekeeping will be. Because if you've got a really stable time source, then it's much easier to synchronize the time source. You don't have to apply as many inputs to fix it. Um, there are various types of frequency inputs that can be used to massage the clock. One of the most common is uh, one pulse per second, and this is a signal that usually comes in over a serial line. It's from some higher quality clock, and we'll talk about higher quality clocks in a few slides, that is used to control uh, the problems of synthetization and frequency uh, within the, the clock itself. And I, I point out here other frequencies are available at a cost. As I said, it, the more accurate you want your clock to be, the more time and effort and money you're going to have to put into to deal with that. So here's a really important question. I, I talked about this earlier. What's your tolerance? Um, so at the moment, uh, FINRA, who uh, regulate financial transactions uh, in the United States, has a standard that everyone who's trading electronically, and that's pretty much everyone right now, very few people trade like on a floor, uh, all of their systems must be synchronized to, you know, generally a NIST quality clock within one second. Now, for computer scientists and people who deal with computers and who've ever been exposed even to NTP, uh, this is kind of laughable. Right? One second is fairly easy. You'd have to really mess up your network not to be able to be within one second for all of your servers. Uh, but it turns out that that's not the the last word uh, from the financial community. Uh, FINRA is now studying whether or not clocks need to be synchronized to within some hundred of nanoseconds of, uh, you know, an agreed upon time. And that starts to get scary. Now, no one really knows how they picked their 100 nanosecond number or 200 nanosecond number that they picked. And this is not a rule yet. But I think there's going to be a lot of argument about that because 200 nanoseconds is going to require a lot of people to buy a lot of equipment. Talk about factory automation, uh, the ro robot arm case, power lines, 50th, 60th of a second, and again, cellular networks. All of these have different tolerances. It really depends on your application. Uh, in a data center, you know, how many transactions are you handling per second on various systems will determine what your tolerance is for knowing when something happened before. So how do we solve this problem? Um, well, one of the first things everyone says is, well, why don't we just pay whoever it is, whoever's making my motherboard, for a better crystal? You know, I can get different options for uh, PCI slots. I can diff get different options for memory controllers. I can get different options for uh, all kinds of components. You cannot, for love or money, get any commodity motherboard maker to sell you a better crystal. And I know this because I've tried it. Uh, you know, I worked for people who had the money and the time to actually work this out, and nobody is interested uh, in putting a better crystal on. So this really isn't a, a solution, unless, of course, you happen to want to design your own motherboard and you're willing to do that. Uh, that's a fairly expensive uh, thing to do. Now, add-on cards. So, you know, you can put a really good clock on a card and have that clock conditioned by GPS for synchronization and one pulse per second for synchronization for backup, and you can get, you know, a better crystal on a card and then put that into a PCI slot. And that is a solution. People do sell those. Uh, they're about $1,000 a card. So if you need to synchronize five machines, that's not so expensive. If you have a data center with hundreds of machines, that starts to get very expensive. And that kind of deployment is something that I have not seen anyone in the commercial space do. Uh, but there are companies that produce these cards and they are certainly one way to improve the synchronization of your system. And if you improve your synchronization, then you don't have to do as much work synchronizing all your clocks. But the current state of the art is what I tend to call at the better clock. And this is for those people who've dealt with NTP, um, you know, this is basically what everyone has been doing since the 1980s. The, um, theory there is that somewhere in the internet or somewhere in your network, 
there's a clock with a really good crystal. And when I talk about a really good crystal, we're talking about something like an oven controlled or a temperature controlled crystal. Or if you've got the money, you know, you can buy yourself a rubidium crystal. And these are very stable and therefore they don't have a lot of wander and can be used uh, in a system where you need to ask a better clock. So the theory is a clock with one of these exists and then you use the network to synchronize time with these clocks. Uh, it would be great if that just worked out of the box, but as with anything, there are complications. So let's talk about the basic theory of operation. Um, one of the terms you'll hear when you look at the, you know, ask a better clock if you're looking at an NTP solution, or we'll talk later about the precision time protocol, PTP, is the stratum of the clock. Right? And stratum is start from zero, zero is the absolute best, and then any clock that's synchronized to a stratum zero clock is a stratum one clock, and then two is to one, and three is to two, et cetera. Uh, between the better clock and its clients, you have the concept of tra time transfer. And this really is asking what time is it? Uh, it's as if you're in a room uh, full of 100 people, except they happen to be servers and not people, and all of those uh, people are asking the person on stage with a watch, what time is it now? What time is it now? What time is it now? So uh, you ask what time is it, and then you measure and connect correct for network propagation time. And based on the outputs of those questions, you steer the local clock, right? So your server or your laptop or whichever system has a wandering clock. It has a crystal that's you know not well synchronized, and it's using the network periodically to say, oh, my clock should be a little faster. It should be a little slower. And so instead of that first graph we saw where the time just was going all the way down to the floor, you'll see an oscillation. You'll see time come back towards what should be zero and it may then shoot past and then uh, you'll see an oscillation. And the narrower that oscillation, the better your time is. And so the goal of all of these network protocols, NTP, PTP, is to get that band within which your local uh, crystal is varying to be as narrow as possible. So I've mentioned the network time protocol. This is the current standard for internet time and used by pretty much everyone. Uh, one of the things I'd like to point out, if you look at the version three and version four uh, RFCs, it's in, it's in ITF uh, protocol. But you see that it's quite a while between uh, standardization efforts and there's a couple reasons for that. One is time is really hard to get right. Uh, and the other is that it takes a long time to get a network protocol right. So uh, you can see 92 to 2010, V4 is the current version. This is what's used for internet-based timekeeping. So if you've got a machine and you connect it to a network um, and you bring up NTPD, then you're gonna get time using this protocol. And this is a client server model where the clients are saying, what time is it, what time is it, what time is it over and over again. Um, their default polling, which is how often they ask what time is it, is uh, once every 64 seconds. And that was chosen, obviously, because you don't want to collapse the network by having everyone on the internet uh, asking what time it is. You know, the NTP servers, there are public service NTP servers out there that are running, uh, supplying time to various different groups. And if you know 50,000 hosts started asking what time it was every second, uh, that would bring a lot of those systems to their knees. It would also mean that instead of transferring video and email and everything else over the internet, all we'd be transferring is time. But because of this default polling rate, it can take hours to get reasonable sync uh, between a better clock and its clients. So I talked about synchronization, synchronization. Let's talk about two other things, um, network jitter. So the biggest enemy of high quality network time is jitter within the network. If the uh, time for packets to propagate between the better clock and its clients uh, is constant, you know, does not change, if it's one millisecond every time, well, then the time transfer calculations are gonna be a lot easier. But of course, anyone who's worked with networks knows that jitter is an, a factor in every network. Uh, it doesn't affect every application equally, but it has a very profound effect on the quality of time transfer. So I'll talk a bit about jitter as we go through the rest of the slides. And then I'm gonna to refer to grandmasters. So uh, in 
uh, network-based timekeeping, the grandmaster is the better clock. So your local grandmaster is the clock that you're getting your time from. And if you look at people who provide these kinds of things, uh, you know, you'll see that they're selling a, a, a grandmaster or building a grandmaster. So one of the other interesting things, and I, I throw this graph up here just to show you how much fun this is. Um, this is a system running on a cloud-based instance uh, using NTP to try and regulate its clock. And as you can see, it's uh, not doing a great job. So now that a lot of services move to the cloud, this time problem becomes a little more difficult because not only do you have um, the usual effects of network jitter and all of this other stuff, but uh, cloud instances can be moved at runtime without the, the cloud owner knowing it. Uh, the quality of time that you're getting out of a virtual machine is usually lower than you would get from basic hardware. This has been a, a challenge for all the virtualization technologies, Zen, VMware, you name it. They all have uh, problems getting really accurate time uh, delivered to virtual machines. Uh, in this particular uh, graph that I showed you, this is a default NTP config that's polling about 50 times per day, and it's swinging plus or minus five milliseconds, which, depending on your tolerance, may or may not be a problem. If your tolerance is outside of uh, plus or minus five milliseconds, that's okay. If it isn't, then you cannot uh, run your application in the cloud, certainly not this cloud. So for the most part, most people are using the network time protocol. Uh, in the early 2000s, a group of people got together to design a new time protocol uh, with you know, a different target audience. NTP is uh, applicable to the entire internet, a global network. You can use NTP to synchronize machines across uh, you know, oceans and in various places, and you will get better or worse synchronization depending on how far you are from your grandmaster. Uh, but NTP is meant to be used as I would say, in the large. The precision time protocol was designed for a LAN environment using multicast. Uh, it was originally designed for some of the applications I discussed earlier. In particular, it was designed for factory uh, floors and for synchronizing measurement equipment. It was originally de de uh, designed by a bunch of folks at Hewlett Packard uh, to synchronize a bunch of their lab equipment in a local area network environment. So. Uh, PTP is, can certainly be run over the internet, but it will not get you better accuracy than NTP over the internet. It's, it's going to be subject to the same problems. It's really designed to be used in the LAN environment. Uh, think about a data center. So at the moment with a software only solution, we can get a better than one microsecond accuracy. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about why you might use some hardware support. There are people there who, uh, who are talking about who, uh, put out systems that do hardware support. I'll talk about why that's there. You see that uh, V3 in this slide has a bunch of question marks. V3 is currently being standardized at the moment. Um, IEEE requires that every five years, each protocol be revisited by its working group. And if changes are to be made, then there's a new version put out. Uh, version two was put out in 2002 and then studied in 07 and the new version, version two went out in 2008. Uh, version two is the current version that everybody's using. Nobody really uses version one. And it, I would not suggest anyone use version one anyway. There were many issues in its protocol design. So uh, that's a very blurry kind of graph with a lot of very small dots. Uh, let's talk about that graph because that graph is probably the best graph you've seen today in terms of quality of time. So. This is a 24-hour measurement. That's the reason you're seeing all these dots, of course, is we're taking hundreds of measurements per hour. The median of that is a 300 nanosecond uh, uh, value around uh, what the grandmaster considers to be accurate time. The full swing is plus or minus 30 mics uh, around zero. Client is pure software. The master is this uh, grandmaster made by a company called Mindberg. So, you know, how does PTP work and how does it get a better time and why would we use it in a data center? So, um, you can see at the top of this uh, slide, you see there's a grandmaster and there's a number of slaves. I 
you know, it's four slave share, but you can have many more than that. Um, instead of the slaves asking the Grand Master, what time is it, what time is it, what time is it, the Grand Master every second is reporting the current time. It sends out a synchronization packet, and it's multicasting this so that all the slaves uh, allowing for network propagation delay see the same sync packet pretty much at the same time. Uh, this lowers the protocol overhead and you know, allows the Grand Master to speak to the entire LAN at once. Um, after the sync, the Grand Master sends another packet called a follow-up. Now, this is not strictly necessary uh, if all the systems are using uh, hardware-based time capture, and I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, but the most common thing you'll see is the follow-up. And the reason the follow-up exists is to tell the slaves when the sync packet left, because the sync packet can't actually be marked with the current time that it left the NIC, the actual network interface card. So when we proceed through this, sync and follow-up, these are the packets that are being multicasted out to the slaves. Now, periodically, a slave will send a delay request. And so in order to measure the network distance between the grandmaster and the slave, so that the slave knows uh, how much adjustment to make to the offset, uh, it needs to find out what is the round trip time between the grandmaster and the slave. And it's not going to find the round trip time if it's just getting one-way packets so you can follow it from the grandmaster. So periodically, it'll send a delay request. The grandmaster will answer the delay request with a delay response. And then the slave will use the time in the sync follow-up uh, delay request, delay response packets to do a calculation to say, oh, packets between the grandmaster and myself take a millisecond to reach me or, you know, half a millisecond, whatever the time is. And then it will use that as input to uh, its own local clock to either speed up its clock or slow down its clock. And again, periodically delay request, delay response. So all network protocols for network time have this problem with jitter. And what are the sources of jitter? So routers, um, you know, routers store and forward packets, depending on how crowded the router is, that's gonna affect how long it takes the packet to cross the router, that's gonna introduce jitter. If the, router is <clears throat> if the router is always busy and always has a constant number of packets in its queues, well, then there might not be much jitter, but that's a very uncommon case for network, pro network uh, routers. Switches is the same thing. Even a cut-through switch uh, can introduce sources of jitter, in particular, if multiple packets try to reach the same outbound link. Uh, a network link can be a source of jitter. Electronic noise, uh, if something, you know, data centers are not electronically quiet. Uh, if your, um, you know, if your network connection is not a good connection or you've got problems in the actual link, that's going to introduce jitter. And then, of course, software, because software is always a problem. So there's a bunch of places in the systems themselves, inside the operating system, inside the software, uh, where you're going to lose time accuracy. Uh, one of these, and this is a very common thing that most people miss, is uh, network interface card interrupts. So in order to make a high bandwidth network interface, uh, one of the things the network interface cards attempt to do is to not interrupt the system very often. They don't interrupt for every packet. This means that a packet that arrives might not be timestamped until might not be timestamped until 10, 20, 30, or 40 more packets arrive. And if the system is using what's called interrupt moderation and that's turned on, that is going to uh, negatively affect the quality of the time. So it's one of the things you need to turn off. Packet buffering in the system. Operating system scheduling, when the threads are scheduled, and the software stack itself uh, can introduce jitter into the measurements. So here's a typical software stack. Uh, I've talked about why you don't want to use get time of day uh, for getting time. Every one of the boxes that you see on the left-hand side, NIC, Ethernet, IP, UDP, and socket, and daemon, these are all the bits of software that need to touch a network time packet. Uh, before the application sees it. Now, if you're taking the time of day at the very top of this, that's a huge amount of software to go through. It's many lines, many chances for jitter to show up. Uh, what I've shown here is the progression of uh, where we've started to take time within the system to improve the quality of that. And so if you get down a level, you can actually tell uh, the operating system, take the time down in the IP layers. That's, you know, getting you past three layers, 
you can actually take time right above the uh, Ethernet software, which is the, using something like the Berkeley packet filter. This is something we do in the time demon that I work on. And that is kind of the best you can do in software uh, before you start having to modify network drivers and things like that. Now, there are people who will sell you a network card that will take a hardware timestamp uh, right at the physical layer. As the bits come off the wire, it'll get a timestamp. That card generally has a stable clock on it. That card is not cheap. Uh, it's almost as expensive. It's as expensive as a uh, uh, time card itself. But that's about the best you're going to do in a server is to get the timestamp there. And the reason to do that is to pull jitter out of the system, right? You want to get that end-to-end -end measurement between the grandmaster and the slave uh, to be as accurate as possible. So one of the things that NTP doesn't have, and one of the things that was not actually part of the uh, PTP standard, but something that we put into the software that we were working on, uh, the Precision Time Protocol Daemon, uh, is taking advantage of the fact that these packets are multicast. So when a lot of people build time systems, they are very focused on how well a single client follows the grandmaster, but they don't consider uh, if you've got a data center full of machines, how you might uh, understand the variations in time across a series of racks or a series of you know, several hundred machines. Uh, and the way we were able to do this, uh, achieve this, is by using the fact that PTP is using multicast. So in multicast, you send a single packet. That packet happens to have a sequence number. Uh, all the hosts see the packets at the same time. I put that in quotes because, of course, there's network propagation time, but it's still a really good way to be able to line time up at the end. One of the problems is in PTPv2, that 16, that sequence number is only 16 bits. And if you're sending a packet once a second, uh, that's not even enough uh, space to get a full day's worth uh, into a single log file. So you have to play tricks with log files. So this is what we call quality files. Uh, Interhost quality, so for each sync, we record the system time, we post-process the files, and then we can tell you for an entire data center, you can look and see for an entire data center, uh, what's the offset between your various hosts over time. Uh, this is, as I said, included in the open source daemon, which I'll mention at the end of this talk. Actually, I'll mention it now. So uh, there are several implementations of the Precision Time Protocol. There's a BSD license. A version called PTPD that I have been working on for seven years now with several other people. It supports actually 1588v2, so that's the current uh, system. It interrupts with NTPD. It is currently hosted on SourceForge. Uh, it will be hosted on GitHub very soon, as everyone seems to be fleeing SourceForge. Uh, but this is an open source theme, and it's used in uh, many places, several companies. It's also included uh, with uh, one Nick Vendor's hardware as a customized version of a precision time protocol daemon. So no talk about time would be complete without a discussion of the leap second. Um, so the leap second is an adjustment to everyone's clocks based on astronomical measurements, uh, you know, where the Earth is, where the sun is. Astronomers really care about this. Computer scientists really don't, but we've been forced to care about it. Um, because there are people who issue telegrams, believe it or not, uh, that tell you that your clocks are going to have to either get slower or faster by a second. Uh, so this periodically, we usually add a second to the clock. It can occur at the end of any month. It generally happens at the end of December or June. Uh, that just seems, seems to have been the custom. Our, um, the last leap second occurred at the end of uh, this June, June 30th. Uh, I don't know if you noticed it, but it was there. Uh, it causes problems every time we have one. Uh, the software generally has been dealt with to handle leap seconds. There are various mechanisms. NTPD has them. PTP uh, D has them. Uh, most operating systems have now been fixed so that they don't mishandle them. Uh, if you search for leap second and news uh, in June, you will find that there were a couple of interesting cases. Uh, one of the ones that was most interesting to me is it turned out that uh, there was a huge amount of BGP traffic, which is uh, internet control traffic, 
right around the leap second, and it's theorized that a bunch of uh, major network routers did not handle the leap second well, and therefore all the routes flapped for a few minutes, and this is uh, a problem for the internet. Uh, but every time there's been a leap second, there's been some software issue. We don't know when the next one will occur, but they do get announced, and then we don't have to worry about them. All right, so I guess we're going to move on to the questions now. Uh, I see there's a set of them down here. Uh, Terry, do you want to go through some of these? Oh, sorry, George. I had to right. myself apparently. <laughs> so, uh, the, <laughs> I, I was the, waiting. The first, yeah, the, the first question has to do with um, uh, when the network latencies get really huge. So as somebody was interested in, you know, when you're dealing with space probes, like the thing out in, in Pluto, um, what are the impacts of trying to do synchronization in an environment like that where there's just these massive latencies involved? So... I, I have yet to work on a spacecraft that goes that far to do time, although if NASA wants to call me up, I'd, I'd definitely love to help. Uh, I am fairly sure that they are not using a time protocol between here and Pluto. Uh, generally, spacecraft, and this is the same way GPS, the GPS satellites work, spacecraft have the very expensive clocks, uh, and, and they're doing special tricks to, to you know, measure how well the synchronization works. Um, you know, to make sure that the frequency is is right um, on the spacecraft and on Earth. I'm also sure that they're using something in the radio transmission and uh, the actual radio frequency transmission to uh, recover accurate time so that they can get, uh, you know, video download, uh, picture downloads, things like that. There's got to be a, a clocking signal in that, but I don't have any actual direct experience. Uh, thanks. Um, so. Another question had to do with um, the interactions with virtual machines. So, I mean, suppose you've got a host and it's using NDPD or PT PTPD to do synchronization, but you've got a bunch of virtual machines running on there, um, and you need those to be synchronized in order to um, be able to do computations. What's, what's the mechanism or the impact of, of, of introducing a virtual machine into this environment? So each virtual machine technology, uh, you know, the VMware, the Zens, uh, various ones, they all have a different solution to this, and it's really dependent. And one of the things you'd have to do if you were going to run a bunch of stuff on a virtual machine is you just have to start doing your own measurement uh, if you really cared about time. I have never had to do um, – uh, I've never had to personally get a cloud-based system synchronized, but – if you look at any of the virtualization technology, you'll, you'll find that this is a, a significant problem for them. Uh, generally, the best you can do, of course, is to uh, run, well, if the virtualization technology doesn't have a special trick, some of them do, uh, you're just going to have to wind up running NTP or PTP against a, a better local clock. And actually, you'd probably be fine, or at least you'd be better off running it against the actual bare metal host, basically have the bare metal host run a, NTP server and at least get the virtual machines lined up with that. Right. Um, another question um, was talking about uh, looking for some best practices with respect to kind of doing bulk data analysis. So if you're a guy who's using Hadoop to you know, run data analysis on a whole bunch of log files that have been collected from a diversity of devices. And, and the person actually sort of mentions Internet of Things where you're really collecting a lot of data um, 
from a, a wide variety of devices. What are the best practices for dealing with the timestamps that are coming out of those if you're trying to do some computation where those times are important? So there's a couple of things. In the Internet of Things, it's going to be relatively difficult for you to have control over all the nodes in the system. Uh, one of the things that can be done in an application is the application can report whether it knows the quality of the time. So, for instance, if you've got an Internet of Things device and it knows that it's got an NTP uh, client on it and that NTP client is, is running, that's something that one could report and put in the log file. Uh, this is not an uncommon practice where you'll, you'll report the time but you'll also say, I don't know how accurate it was, or I know it was accurate to this level. Uh, stating a level of accuracy at a period is one way to, to work around that. Right. Uh, I kind of, I guess a follow-up to that was, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to, uh, you know, just make simple calls to get a timestamp and jam them into a log. How do I find out? how accurate that is? What do I have to do as a programmer to know what the accuracy of that is if I wanted to add that kind of information into my log file? Right, so if you're looking at clock dead time, <clears throat> um, it won't report how accurate the underlying clock is, uh, but you can certainly say, well, you know, I was using this call, I was using that call. Uh, one of those things is that, you know, you could actually use, uh, if you're on a server that's running NTP or PTP, uh, you can actually use the log data from either of those. They both produce voluminous log data uh, that can be used alongside the timestamps to say how accurate time was at the time that the timestamp was taken. Right. Um, the GPS has this reputation of having a super, um, uh, I guess, accurate clock associated with it. So, um, you know, is there a way that software developers can leave, I guess maybe, is that reputation warranted? Is, is it really an accurate clock? And if so, is there a way that us as software developers can kind of leverage off that, that existing infrastructure? Sure. Um, so there's several ways to, to do that. And one of the things to realize is that most grandmasters at this point synchronize themselves to GPS. Uh, and GPS is very accurate, and it's very accurate because both the satellites and the ground stations or whatever is listening to it, have to have relatively well synchronized crystals, right? You're not putting a 10 cent crystal on a multi-billion dollar satellite, thankfully. Um, and so the way they, the way GPS achieves this is through some protocol tricks and through using much better, you know, it's a better clock. Uh, in terms of software developers being able to leverage GPS, there's a few ways to do this. Of course, if you're in a data center, you might put in a grandmaster type clock and that would synchronize the GPS. There are GPS cards that can talk to uh, servers. There are also GPS, uh, you know, small handheld GPS devices that can be hooked to servers over a serial line. Uh, there's an open source daemon that, that does that uh, as a way of being an input. And if you're using NTPD, uh, NTPD can talk to any of these types of technologies. PTPD very specifically talks to the protocol, but NTP can actually derive time from, uh, you know, can, can condition time based on a one pulse per second signal plus network time, plus the GPS signal over a serial port, et cetera. It, it really depends on how you're going to deploy it. Right. Uh, somebody made a comment, and I think they were uh, maybe looking for some feedback on this, that it, when you're building a distributed system, um, event ordering is super important. So we, we really care deeply about what event order is. Um, but event duration, we don't seem to care about much at all. I mean, do you think that that's true, that it really is just ordering and not duration? So it depends on what you're trying to look at. Dur duration is something you usually look at in terms of performance. Uh, you know, how long did it take this thing to execute? I, I always wind up looking at both because I wind up looking at, uh, I tend to look at a lot of high performance computing stuff. So we care about how long did it take and when did it happen. Uh, in terms of debugging a distributed system, ordering is really important. and uh, there are other ways to achieve ordering if you don't care about the external time. Like Lamport clocks and things like this are ways to have uh, distributed systems where you can say something about, you know, who did what to whom uh, and in what order as opposed to when. Right. Uh, a really kind of uh, details question. Um, is the expensive get time of day the same as the expensive mode of clock underscore get time? 
that really depends on the operating system. Uh, if I look at the code on uh, FreeBSD, which is the operating system I work on, uh, get time of day is still a little more expensive than even the most expensive clock get time, but that's really going to depend also on uh, underlying hardware. So operating systems have various sources of time. Uh, one of the things that gets you relatively accurate cheap time on a modern server is the Intel timestamp counter. So if you're using that, then that call is cheaper because it's a single instruction. Um, it's a synchronizing instruction, but it's cheap. Uh, whereas it used to be people would have to go and get, you know, time from an actual time counter, which would take longer. So there's, it's, there's not a simple answer to that. Uh, if you care about accurate time, you really do not want to be using get time of day in your code. If you really care about portability, then you want to use get time of day. Right. Oh, and I, I think one last question since we're at the top of the hour. Um, uh, it says, Google published a paper where they tell their data warehouses um, uh, that they use atomic clocks to synchronize uh, time across their warehouses. Uh, are, yeah, do you know anything about that and have any comments on that? So I know there's a paper from uh, the Google folks about something called Spanner, uh, which I have not looked at, though people are, are welcome to look that up. It's, a, it's an available paper online. Uh, in terms of the atomic clock stuff, I don't have a view inside of Google's data centers. Uh, I am not surprised. You know, I would not be surprised, of course, to hear that they're using atomic clocks um, to synchronize their data centers. And what they're doing is they're not using the atomic clocks to synchronize them. What they're doing is that that's their better clock in each data center, and they're depending on the quality of its synchronization to make synchronization amongst them easier. Right. That makes sense. Um, so we're at the top of the hour, so I think that that's it. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation today, George. That was excellent. Um, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Uh, so. Uh, uh, as a quick follow-up, uh, again, there are a number of sites that you can uh, look at on the ACM uh, to continue with uh, the information about this. Um, if you've got questions about this webcast, please send them to learning at acm.org. As we mentioned before, there is an archive of all the webinars at the Learning Center as well. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we're going to be pushing out a survey, and we would very much appreciate your feedback on that. Uh, so that, as we say, we can continue to improve the quality of the webinars and get them on topics that uh, you folks are interested in learning about. So thank you, everybody, and that is the end of the webinar.